Religious scholars could make the argument that Pope Gregory III intentionally moved All Saints Day that was celebrated in the Roman Catholic Church from an April date to a November 1st date. And he did it for this reason. In the British Isles, there was a pagan religious festival called Samhain. Some call the name Samhain. Others might say All Hallows' Eve. We would say Halloween. And the reason why the Pope moved All Saints' Day to November the 1st was to counter the impact that this pagan festival was making on the citizens of the British Isles. Samhain, I want to say Samhain again, Samhain was a festival of the end of summer. The harvest was in, the people were now taking the animals and putting them into the barns, and uh, they were also slaughtering the weak animals for food during the course of the winter. But sitting in the center of this festival was this. All the individuals that had died during that year had their souls roaming the earth. And it was through sacrifices of animals, gifts given to the pagan priests, that the priests were called upon to find places for these roaming souls to reside. It was a perfect opportunity for the Roman Catholic Church to share good news with the people of the British Isles, to tell them that there was a God who had already established a heavenly realm, and at the time of death, the souls of their loved ones would be residing in the glory of that almighty God. What a wonderful opportunity for them to move in with their religious views to this pagan culture. So they moved the holiday of All Saints Day to November the 1st. And they also moved All Souls Day to November the 2nd. Now All Saints Day in the Roman Catholic Church celebrated canonized saints, those that I explained the children a little bit ago, pious lives, miracles attributed to them following their deaths. That was celebrated on November the 1st, right after All Hallows' Eve or the festival of Samhain. On November the 2nd, what was celebrated was those that experienced the beatific vision. Anybody know what that is all about? Beatific vision is this. All mortal individuals who had died and had experienced the glory of God, had the opportunity to come before God, stand before God face to face in the realm of heaven. As we think about those that we have loved and those that we have lost, what a comforting thought to know that they have experienced the beatific vision, that they have had the opportunity and continue to live the opportunity eternally in the glory of Almighty God. What a blessing to hear those words. The United Methodist Church doesn't canonize saints, but we do recognize all saints day, those living and those who have died, who love the Lord, who profess their faith in Jesus Christ and who have chosen to serve our Lord in this world. Together, the living and the dead, we do make up the community of saints. This morning's lesson is taken from Revelation in the 21st chapter, beginning with the first verse. And I've chosen to do a Bible study with you this morning. These are familiar words. Many of us have been to funerals where these words are spoken. And the words are spoken in a form of an assurance that each one of us at the time of death will be in the presence of Almighty God. You can find the reading in your pew Bibles in page 244 in the New Testament. That's the second half of the book or you can turn in your own Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. 
John is the writer of Revelation. He's been exiled to an island on Patmos. And there John experiences a number of visions. Now visions are not new to anyone in Scripture. Many people have had visions from the beginning of the Bible until the end. But John has some very special visions. And his first vision is this. He sees a new heaven and a new earth because the old have passed away. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void and without form. God created all things and gave dominion of all of creation to humankind. But humankind was disappointing to God, and at one point God chose to destroy that which God had created. The only survivors were Noah and his family. The ark touched dry ground. And the command of God to know was to go forth and multiply and fill the earth, enjoying the new creation that has been established. You see, Koheleth, the teacher in Ecclesiastics, says there's nothing new under the sun. John is making this statement, but over and over again, shot through and through in Scripture, are references to God creating and recreating and recreating. In the Gospel of Mark, the first speaking that Jesus does is this. I have come for this purpose. I have come to establish the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven on earth. Jesus came that we might experience not only new and recreated creation, but also experience the realm of God in the here and the now. John sees the vision once again of the new creation. And at the end of that verse, there's a strange passage. It says, and the sea was no more. If we go back into antiquity, look at the story of Gilgamesh. We have Marduk, the creator of the universe. And this is ancient religion, far older than our own. Marduk, the creator of the universe, has an arch enemy. And the arch enemy is Tiamat. Tiamat is a god of water, of the ocean, of the seas. In religious history, water always represents chaos. That's where the Leviathan lives. Chaos, darkness, troubles, stress, trials, all come out of water. Second verse of Genesis chapter 1 makes this statement that the winds swept across the darkness of the waters. Wind. The word is ruah. Wind, spirit, breath. Spirit of God swept across the waters, calmed the waters so that creation could begin. You see, it takes deity, deity to calm the waters, deity to address chaos and darkness in the world. Jesus calmed the waters. Jesus even walked on the water. John writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea, chaos, darkness, was no more. In the second verse, John draws on his knowledge of Greek philosophy. Plato taught that there is an invisible world that we cannot see. And in this invisible world are perfect ideals and forms. On earth, the ideals and forms are imperfect. John writes, there is a new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven. Not the first time it's been said in Scripture. Paul talks about a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven in Galatians. It's also written in Hebrews. It's written in Ezekiel. It's written in Haggai. It's written in the apocryphal texts of Tobit and Baruch and Estrus. A new city coming down from heaven. The Jerusalem that we know has been destroyed.